Hello everyone and welcome to another AP Computer Science video. In this video we're going to start our second to last topic for this course. Um, that while it's not necessarily the most useful in modern programming, it's still an important concept that many programming languages uh, uh, have as part of their design and there are situations that uh, can benefit from this approach. This is not a necessarily a technical thing. This is more of a bigger picture planning mechanism to minimize how much code we as programmers write, to link classes together in terms of their meaning, the semantics between them, and how they relate to one another, um, and hopefully create a system that's that's flexible and, and reusable. That's the goal of this next topic. The topic is called inheritance, and if you think about that word inheritance, and what it means in biology or in genetics or even in law, uh, generally speaking, to inherit something means to receive it or have it passed down to you from some parent or guardian or uh, person related to you in some fashion. Right? So you might inherit something from an uncle or an aunt. Or you might inherit your genetics from your parents. Right? And so the idea of inheritance is the idea that a class can receive information, functionality, meaning methods, and data, meaning variables, instance variables in particular, from other classes. And this is kind of a big deal. And in fact, it's been true the whole time throughout the course, but we've kind of ignored it and not really recognized it for what it was. And so we'll be talking about that um, in a moment, and we'll draw some diagrams just to make it clear. But the idea is that we can take advantage of this to minimize how much code we write as we design a complex system. Now I'll say that the, the example I'm going to follow is not necessarily a brilliant system, but it's meant to just express the different portions of the, of the language we need to know. We do learn some new keywords, we do learn some facts about things we may not have been aware of, but they were always there uh, behind the scenes. I'll start off by making a new um, package in our code, in our notes, and so I'm going to make a new Java package and we'll call this inheritance. So there it is, there's our package. Um, so what I'll do is I'm gonna draw a diagram that represents some facts that we have, and then we'll discuss uh, how we can write code to express this idea. So I have my little uh, note-taking program here. And so the example I wanna take is uh, of a school. We maybe will have a system that wants to represent different people in the school and, 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 and manage them in some way. Uh, but we want to recognize that our system should handle all kinds of people, not just students, not just teachers, not just administration, but everybody that may or may not exist in our system. So this can involve parents, it could be alumni, it could be teachers, it could be uh, staff, it could be coaches, it could be uh, students, uh, and so on. And so uh, the design we're going to make is going to take advantage of the commonalities across these different things. We start off when we design for inheritance, what data is shared across all our end goal classes, right, those things that we're trying to represent. For example, what is the commonality between a teacher and a student? Or an administration uh, official and a, and, and a teacher uh, um, and a coach? And as we establish these facts, we can write classes that have those commonalities and then expand them only for the extra details. And so the idea is hopefully the things that are in common only have to be written once. And that's the plan we're going to have. So my example is a very small scale example, but hopefully it'll be enough to kind of get the point across. So I'll start off with, at a minimum, what can we establish? First, what are we going to call it? And what data uh, and potentially functionality does every uh, top level thing that's common across our system about the school going to have? And I'll say, just for the sake of ease, we'll say, let's make a class called person that represents all people that exist in our school system. So I'm going to start off um, with our... I'm gonna draw a little box, and this will be our uh, person class. All right. So, what is a person? And we'll say that a person has two things, and we'll come back to these: a name and an age. All right. So, everyone has a name. And again, we could go into more details and say first name and last name, but I'm not going to do that. I was going to say a name, and we'll say an age, because even though we don't necessarily have to know the age, maybe that's a convenient fact to be aware of. Or we could maybe say birthday or. Um, or the year they start at their school, but I'm gonna stick with those two facts, the name and the age of the person. And so let's go ahead and remember that as a thing. So now, that means that every person, student, teacher, um, alumni, parent, they all have a name and an age, and those are things we wanna keep track of. Now this is great, and so I might make some functionality to display the name, to display the age, or adjust the age, uh, or, or change the name, all those things are kind of common. And when I describe a student, what I'm going to say is a student is a person, 
but with a little bit more data. So students are persons, they have a name and an age, but they might also have something, for example, a GPA um, and the grade that they're in. So we're extending or expanding or growing the person class to be a bit more, but we don't want to have to rewrite the name and the age and the accessors and mutators for those things. So we're going to instead use the inheritance mechanism of Java to do so. In our diagram, we're going to draw the diagram first. We're going to use an arrow to represent uh, the direction of this inheritance. So I'm going to say, here's our uh, arrow, and the next class we're going to create is what we're going to call a student. So a student um, is a person, and so this relationship here, we're going to call, I'm going to put this arrow here, we're going to say is a, is a relationship, because a student is a person. But I want to make it clear that uh, with our arrow, it's one directional. We can say all students are persons, but not all persons are students, right? Because we can imagine there might be a, a person, for example, a teacher that is a person, but not a student, right? But if I'm a student, then for sure I'm a person. I have a name and an age. So this is a one directional relationship. And so students are persons or a student is a person. That, that relationship is one directional. In our case, the arrow goes to the thing um, that is related or expanded from the, from the uh, parent uh, person um, design. And so in a similar relationship, we could do the same thing for a teacher. We could say, you know what? Teachers are also persons. So we're going to make another class. And we'll call this one uh, a teacher. And so if we're going to make classes that inherit from another class, what we're saying is, one, they, they are the same as those things, right? A teacher is a person, a student is a person, and they have a bit more. If there was no difference, then we wouldn't bother making these separate classes. The idea is that there must be some kind of expansion of data uh, and or functionality. And so I'll say a student has a GPA and a grade level, and we'll say a teacher has the subject they teach or maybe the department that they're in, and, and then a list of students that are part of their advisory or homeroom. I don't know what term you might use at your school, but if you have like a homeroom, a group of kids that always meets every day and, and you're with your teacher and you might do certain events together. Um, and, so an advisory is a common, a common term or um, homeroom. And so teachers have a list of students that are related to them in that fashion. They're connected through that, that advisory program. Um, and so that's what a teacher is. Both are, both are persons, but this is again a one direction relationship. Teachers are persons, but not every person is a teacher. Right? And now you might ask yourself, what's the relationship between student and teacher? And in terms of inheritance, there isn't one. You might say that they're siblings because they both inherit from the same class, but the reality is there's no direct relationship between them. And the suggestion that I made that teachers have a list of students connected to them, that is not an inheritance relationship, but a composition relationship. Right? A teacher is composed of multiple objects of type student in a list. That's not the same thing as inheriting. We're not gaining data from students. We just have access to student objects. That is a different um, type of relationship. Some terminology we want to use, and I'll use this a lot throughout my videos and my lectures, is uh, sometimes we say that a class is a parent class. And so in this case, person is a parent. And in this example, the, the teacher would be a child class. So the parent is person and the child is teacher. And similarly, we would say that this one is also a child class, right? Student is a child of person. Teacher is a child of person. Person is the parent of student and the parent of child. Um, and that's just kind of terminology. The more technical term, the more you, the, the term you'll hear more often in Java in particular and, and maybe other programming languages, also we'll also say this is called a super class. And this is related because we're going to see that as a special keyword in the Java language. So if the person is the parent or super class, then teacher will say is the child or sub class, right? And so we'll say this is also a subclass of student. So it doesn't really matter how you say it, but this is the general terminology you might hear. A parent class, super class, a child class, a subclass. Um, let's expand this a little bit further. And I want to say um, we could also argue that, uh, or not argue, but we could say that, you know what, we could expand this inheritance further. This is just like the real world, if we're talking about genetics, right, you are the, um, 
the children of your parents, but your parents are also the children of someone else, and those would be your grandparents. And so we can kind of extend this inheritance as far as we want, as deep as we want, but if we're doing so, it is for the goal of extending more features, more data, more functionality from one of these classes, not to do the same work. Right? Teachers have a name and an age because they are persons. Students have a name and an age because they're persons. Teachers also have a list of students and a subject. Students also have a GPA and a grade level. So I'm going to do one more and I'm going to say, um, we'll say that with it, from a teacher, we have another inheritance class going on. We're going to say, you know what? There are a special category of teachers that are teachers, but we'll call them grade leads. So a grade lead. What is a grade lead? And we'll say a grade lead is a teacher through the inheritance structure, but they also have some extra information. And we'll say what they have is which grade they're in charge of. So for example, ninth grade, and then the list of teachers that are under them as part of their team. So for example, if there's a collection of ninth grade teachers that deal with all ninth graders as part of the advisory program or homeroom system, then the grade lead is in charge of making sure that those teachers know what to share, what information to share with their ninth graders or their 12th graders or whatever the grade they have, happen to be. And so we're saying grade leads are also teachers because they might teach a subject, but they also are in charge of managing other teachers. Right? And so we can say that this is some kind of expansion. Um, and again, this is the same idea, but that what this is going to imply is that the grade lead is a child of teacher. And that suggests that not only is a teacher a child of person, but it is also a parent, which means that it's also a superclass. And that means that grade lead is a subclass. And again, we can come up with all kinds of scenarios. And so you can imagine that a student is another thing. And we can maybe come in with an, another inherent structure and say, you know what, alumni, a student that has graduated is a student with more information. Now, what makes an alumni more than a student, we might say, well, the college they're going to, if they're going to a college or a technical school, maybe it's the their uh, intended major when they're going to go to school, where they're going to study, or they currently work, or where they've moved to. And so we can imagine, we can come up with all kinds of scenarios where uh, any class is an expansion of another one where we don't want to rewrite all the same work. And right? so this is the, the goal we're going to have, is following this design, um, and hopefully we should... Um, uh, be able to write code that minimizes how much work we have to do um, and see some of those technical aspects, some of those keywords that help this happen. But before I move on to the actual code, there is one more hidden uh, inheritance that we don't see, but it's always, always, always been there, and whether we knew it or not. And so I need to um, kind of shrink my, my drawing a bit to move uh, what's happening. And so what we'll say is, okay, well, this is great. This is the inheritance structure I made. But the reality is, whether we knew it or not, every single class, whether written by us or written by the Java people, has always been inheriting from some special parent class. In fact, if we're going to give kind of the, the analogy or the metaphor, we're going to say, you know what? Uh, there is a like Adam and Eve type class, the ultimate starting point of our uh, class system in Java, and this special class is called the capital O object class, so object. So I'm going to fix this drawing by going above person, and I'll say that there was always a class that everyone was inheriting from called capital O object. And this is a special class because what its primary goal is, it doesn't have a lot of functionality, is to find the RAM for the data you want and to give you a certain ca a collection of methods that may or may not be good enough for you, but you always get them. In particular, the two that we're going to care about in this um, t discussion in this course is the toString method and the equals method. Um, and we'll talk more about those in details and what we can gain from them and what we can do with them. And so I'm going to finish this by putting our connection. And we're going to say, whether we knew it or not, oops, let me fix that a little bit better. There it is. So whether we knew it or not, uh, person is an object. And in fact, if I were to really draw this diagram for the entire universe of Java classes, then what I could say is, you know what, whether we know it or not, I'm going to go all the way to the side here that uh, a scanner inherited from object, whether we knew it or not. Right? And I'm going to go over here and I'm going to say, you know what, whether we knew it or not, for example, a string was an object. right? And so every class um, is an object by default. 
Now, whether we saw it or not is irrelevant, but the idea is that everything is inherited from object, all class types. Now, primitives are different. Primitives are not classes. They're just simply raw values. But any non-primitive type, string, scanner, array list, um, I mean, it's not strictly true that array list because there's, there's like other inheritances going on, but generally speaking, if you don't know who the parent is, it's not explicit, then the parent is object. And again, this doesn't have a huge impact, but we will see that it does in fact happen um, and does have control of what's going on. So with this said, let's keep this in mind and we'll come back to it. We care about this middle section, which is going to be what we're designing. But whether we know it or not, along with this is the baggage of, hey, we are objects. Persons are objects. And again, if I ask you, so on, on an exam, on the AP exam, they might give you a diagram and say, well, uh, is, is, are all grade leads considered persons? And the answer is yes, because all grade leads are teachers and all teachers are persons. Therefore, all grade leads are persons. This is kind of a grandparent relationship or a super, super relationship. Likewise, I might say, are all students grade leads? And the answer is no. No students are grade leads because students are persons. But beyond that, you can't really go down this chart to figure out what it is. There's no relationship between student and grade lead. Or I might ask you, are all teachers grade leads? And the answer is no. Some teachers may be grade leads, but not every teacher is a grade lead. So all grade leads are teachers, but that's not the same thing as saying all teachers are grade leads. And then I might say, finally, are students objects? And the answer is yes. Every class is an object. Student is a person, and a person is an object. Therefore, a student is an uh, object. And a scanner is an object, and a string is an object, and a grade lead is an object. And how many levels of inheritance have to occur is irrelevant to that question. Every class is an object. So with this said, we'll start off uh, in this video with uh, a uh, brief setup of our class and we'll go from there. And we'll, we'll stop this video and we'll continue on another video with the, the, the rest of the design. So let's go ahead and set up our um, code. So we'll start off, we have our inheritance package. Let's make a new class uh, and we're going to call this class person. Capital P because it is a class name and there it is, capital person. And so there it is. And just like we had to said, I'm, again, this is kind of an arbitrary example. So we'll say all persons have a name and an age. So a name we'll say is a string. So private because it is an instance variable. And that's the rule that we follow for the AP exam and in general in Java. Um, string and we'll call it a name. And then I said every person has an age. So we'll say string. Well, not string, sorry. Int age. Let's go ahead and make a, uh, I want to make some constructors. But before I do that, I want to point out something else. And this is where I'm going to end the video. We'll continue next time with more detail. Uh, one, the first fact we have to recognize um, when it comes to inheritance is, and I'm going to go ahead and put this note actually at the top here. So let's do this. By default, all classes inherit from the object class. So person is a, is, a, is a object whether we know it or not. It's the default behavior. And when that's said, another note I'm going to put is if no constructors are uh, explicitly written, then a default is created implicitly that accepts no parameters, which is what default means, and does nothing. That's one one thing we're going to uh, uh, have to remember. And this is convenient whether we see it or not. And then the, the next thing that's also important to recognize, and this is where we're going to prove this in, in our next video, is that we'll say all constructors must call their parent constructors um, before anything else. And we'll see that this has always been true. And even, even though we've never really done it, and at least we never thought we did it, it's going to happen one way or the other. So this is uh, a fact that we're going to recognize. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop this video by proving this point that if we do not uh, write our constructor ourselves, then a default is made for us. And if a default is made for us, it accepts no parameters and doesn't do anything meaningful. Meaning it doesn't even initialize the instance variables. They may have default values like null and zero, but our constructor will do anything. And so how am I going to prove this? Let's make one more class. And we'll call this inheritance tester. 
this is going to test all the things that we do. We're going to say inheritance tester. Let's make a main class. Or sorry, main method. There it is. And let's go ahead and construct a person. How do we construct a person? Or we make a variable of type person. And I'll call it P1. And then I'll call the new keyword. And then I said a default constructor was made for us, whether we recognize it or not. And I'll prove it by saying new person, empty parentheses. There is no error. So ask yourself, how could you call a constructor that didn't exist? For example, if I tried to do this, one, two, three, it, it gives me an error. It says, constructor in person, class person, cannot be applied to given types. It says, required no arguments found in integers. So this says, look, there is no constructor that accepts an int, which is pretty reasonable because we didn't write a constructor. But when I do nothing, it says, well, the error should be, there is no constructor that accepts no parameters. But that's not true. Because the rule is, by default, all uh, classes receive an implicit default constructor if one is not written. And so I'll end this by sh putting one more rule, uh, or one more fact into this, and I'll add it to our note here. If, a, if any constructor is created, the implicit default is taken away. And how am I going to prove this? I'm not going to make a default. I'm going to make a non-default constructor. So we'll do that first. That's an easy thing to do. So here we go. I'll say public person. And my non-default will accept a string and a number, an integer, and then we'll save them to the name and the age. So I'll say string and m and int um, ag. I will simply remember those values. My name is equal to whatever they gave me, and my age is equal to whatever they gave me. And so as soon as I save this, if I go back to my inheritance tester, suddenly there's an error. It says, hey, wait a minute. There is no constructor that, that has no arguments. You must only use one that has a string and an int. So this is proof that if we make our own constructor, default or not, then the implicit default is given. It makes sense that if we make our own default, then theirs is gone because we're kind of changing it. And if we make a non-default that says, you know what? Since you made your own, you can't use our kind of cheaply made one for you. So use yours. And there is that error in our in our testing class. So if I want to make a constructor or call a constructor, I should do both. And so the answer to this is, you know what? Whether we choose to use one constructor or another, it is good practice to always make a default constructor. It just It's just one of those things. You should have a default um, for, for, for use just in case. So here we go. Let's say public person. There's my default. And we'll simply initialize the name. So you know what? Our name, if you don't tell us who the person is, their default name is Jane Doe, right? which is the generic unknown person's, uh, one of the unknown person's names. And we'll say, you know what? This is a high school. So we'll assume the minimum age is, since we're going to deal with high school, we'll say, oh, I guess you're a freshman, so your age is 15, right? Or, or I guess, yeah, 14 or 15. It doesn't really matter. So obviously, if we make teachers eventually, teachers are typically not 15 years old, and we may have to change the age. But we'll say, you know what, it's not unreasonable for a high school system to say students are the more common type of person, and the freshman class is usually 14 or 15. So we'll say, you know what, the default age is 15. You can put whatever age you want. It's not that important. Um, and so there it is. So I'm going to save this. And we can see now uh, this error goes away because now we have a default. So either it's implicit or we make it ourselves. In this case, I am of the, of, of the opinion that if you're going to make a non-default, you should make a default just in case. All right? And so we still haven't proven this point. This is important. We will come back to this point in our next video. I'll see you in that next video.